as you as you all know, uh, 2015 we had the monumental Paris Agreement. At that time, people were feeling very confident that electrification was going to drive the decarbonization agenda. I think that in the last seven to eight years, we're starting to see a little bit more of a reality-based approach and a deeper understanding of how much fossil carbon is throughout the entire economy. And so if we're going to decarbonize, obviously there's a couple ways that we can go. We can produce an alternative fuel or chemical and in pathway and then blend it with a fossil product. And over time, maybe we can break, make more of that material. But recently people have been thinking about another pathway, which is to produce not necessarily a refined molecule, but to produce a crude, either through direct air capture or by a bio-based method where you could produce a carbon stream that could then meet fossil carbon at the point of refining. And from that system, you could then produce all of the fuels and chemicals that we use today. And we're lucky to be joined today by three, maybe four, depending on our virtual participation, but three people at least that are leading this, leading the way. So we have John Cooper, who's the Director General for Fuels Europe, and his membership is uh, obviously the refiners of Europe. And so we're very lucky to have him and to have his perspective on this topic. Uh, we're joined by uh, Preeti Jain from a leading industrial biotechnology company called Lonzatech. Lonzatech is, has almost a hybrid solution, but uh, definitely a biotech solution that's leveraging the power of industrial biotechnology to pull carbon out of uh, intense uh, gaseous streams and then repurpose that carbon into the circular carbon economy. And then we're also joined on screen by Devin O'Grady. Devin, I actually, when I first met him, he was working with uh, Natural Resources Canada, but now he is a member of the Canadian Fuels Association, which is a collection of Canadian refiners. And then we might be joined by Michael McAdams with the American Biofuels, uh, excuse me, the, Amer the Advanced Biofuels Association, which is a US-based association of advanced biofuels producers. Um, and so uh, without further delay, I'm just gonna start peppering our panel with questions. But what I wanted to say is that we are a small group and we are in a small room. And so if anybody at any point in time feels compelled to ask a question or to say anything really interesting, we would like to hear it. So for example, uh, we, I think we all agree, I will stop talking in a second. We all agree that the future is we want as many renewable electrons as possible. We want as much uh, low carbon carbon and low carbon emissions hydrogen as possible. And so we imagine a systemic holistic approach. And so we don't have anybody here on the panel expert in hydrogen. We don't have anybody here that's an expert in um, say natural gas. And so if there's somebody here that wants to add something, please do. So don't, don't hesitate. But the first question is to get us going is I want to appeal to everybody's expertise. And so I'm going to ask the, the same question of everybody, which is please give us an update from either your part of the world or your sector. So I'm asking John to give him his views on the, the very fluid situation policy-wise in Europe. I'm going to ask the same question of Devin. And then for Preeti, uh, from her uh, position in industrial biotechnology to, to get her take on how Lanza Tech is actually implementing solutions in the real world. So I have to hand this microphone to the next speaker, even though it doesn't work for this room, but it's necessary for the recording. So John, your views on uh, Fit for 55 transportation liquid fuels. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jerry. And I'll stand just so it's easier for you to hear me. So yeah, uh, John Cooper, uh, 
Fuels Europe is the business association for all of the refining companies in Europe, 40 companies, 80 refineries. We figure around 50 million customers every day. I mean, in fact, almost everything that moves in Europe, with the exception of electric trains and some electric cars, are powered with the products that we make. We're also in, you describe it as a fluid uh, political situation. I would say it was more of an electric political situation. Excuse the pun. Um, Europe has got very, very strong policies and a strong political consensus to really be a climate leader and have put in place a law that requires climate neutrality by 2050. Now, I'm quite tempted to draw a graph for you on the uh, flip chart. I'll, I'll resist, but it is simply a collection of wedges that go down to zero in 2050. This is the carbon budget that the European Commission have described and is their reference point for every law that they make from now on. And for us, we've had a difficult and deep conversation with our members to say, look, you're in the sector that is currently a very significant part of the energy sector and the carbon budget allowable for that sector, transport, actually goes to actual zero. It's not a net zero where there's a positive and some offset, it's an actual zero. And we're being told that is the reference point for every policy that is made. Now it's clear electrification with renewable electricity can be a big part of that, but we're also clear that liquids needs to be a part of it too. And our starting point for our work was actually the liquid products we have today are outstanding in terms of their qualities, in terms of their fit for um, purpose in all of the different transports. And so we set ourselves the task of finding every technology you can deploy to make broadly similar products for cars, trucks, aviation, and maritime. And in fact, if you look at our work, we've got five key technology groups. You start with the first generation existing biofuels we've got, but then you go into advanced forms of biomass conversion to, to, to scale up significantly using wastes and residues uh, going further. And then finally using electricity uh, for making e-fuels or synthetic fuels. And the manufacturing processes would all be using carbon capture and storage and green hydrogen and renewable electricity to get you there as well. We've done the maths, how much you can make. We can make by 2050 around 150 million tons a year, which is not enough to replace petroleum. Petroleum today is 350. So we're about a third of what today's petroleum volumes are, but that's for Europe. And that's using predominantly European feedstocks. And that's supported by academic work that shows those feedstocks are available. You need strong policies to get you there. And in terms of carbon pricing and pricing uh, the difference between, between a renewable and a, and, and, and a petroleum fuel, we already have carbon pricing close to 100 euros a ton of carbon. But in fact, the hidden price signals in renewables blending and vehicle uh, regulations are 500 euros a ton of carbon plus. And that is actually enough to make the investments to do this possible. I'll stop there. I could go a lot further, but it's time for me to hand over. Thanks, uh, Gary, and thanks to Atlantic Council for giving us this opportunity to be here. I'm from Lanza Tech, and we are a leader in sustainable fuels and chemicals. Uh, those of you who don't know about Lanza Tech, we, have, we are a carbon capture and transformation company. And we do believe that every carbon needs a second chance. When I say every carbon needs a second chance, our technology takes waste carbon from industrial off gases, agri residue, or municipal solid waste. And with our proprietary micro, which is a biocatalyst, we convert that into fuel ethanol. And I'm happy to share with this uh, audience out there that our technology has been commercialized at scale. We have two commercial units running in China using industrial off gases from steel mill and ferroalloy mills, converting that into ethanol. And we have two units, one in India, one in Europe with ArcelorMittal and Indian oil coming up online this year. We have seven units under construction and seven units in the advanced stages of engineering. Uh, I wish we could have more people because we are talking about future of refining. Because in terms of addressable market size, gentlemen and ladies, we are talking about around US dollar one trillion market size of sustainable fuels and chemicals. So it's a right time we start looking into this direction. And uh, at Lanza Tech, we are helping industry partners to help meet their net zero commitments and make that transition 
where we see that uh, in future the carbon will not be coming from under the ground but the waste carbon from which is available above the ground can be a source of products we use in our daily life so i will stop there gary for this part of question Devin, please. You're muted. <laughs> of course, thanks. Um, so I think in terms of uh, a Canadian update here, um, you know, over the last five years now, uh, under development has been uh, the Canadian clean fuel standard, which is uh, like a California uh, low carbon fuel standard. Um, so it is a performance-based uh, regulatory approach uh, whereby um, obligated parties must reduce the carbon intensity of their uh, fossil transport products um, out to 2030 in this case. Um, so it's been a uh, it's been a long journey in, in this uh, regulatory development, um, but this policy is driving uh, actions from uh, from CFA's members um, across the board, uh, and and kind of as John uh, alluded to before. Uh, there are a number of pathways, and we know there's not just going to be a, a one-size-fits-all. Uh, so whether it's electrification, or as uh, Jerry mentioned before, hydrogen, uh, and of course low-carbon fuels uh, like biofuels. Um, so there, there are several compliance pathways that are available uh, to meet the uh, to meet the clean fuel standard. Uh, one of which is blending low-carbon fuels, and that's where our members are uh, seeing a lot of action there and taking initiatives. It's really, uh, you know, driving um, our activities and our, our thoughts as we go along uh, in terms of where and how and, and, and timing wise are we going to make these investments uh, in these types of fuels. Um, so jurisdiction plays a, a key role, uh, you know, items are key factors such as feedstock, uh, sustainable feedstock. Um, and partnerships with other uh, with other entities as well uh, and collaborating on technology. Uh, so in terms of when these regulations are expected to come into force, um, we expect uh, final regulations to be published this June, so you know, in the coming months, uh, and, then, uh, and then they'll be coming into force um, likely by the end of this year. Um, so you know, with that, it's critical um, that a number of tools are available uh, for this successful implementation. Um, so there's a, there's a number of pieces that are kind of part of the regulations. Um, so in terms of sustainable feedstocks, there's a, a land use and biodiversity criteria. There's of course a, a credit trading market. Um, and I think most, or one of the most important elements, and this kind of can lead into our discussion around uh, carbon accounting, is uh, the fuel life cycle assessment model, which will be used to calculate the carbon intensities of, uh, of the low carbon materials. Um, so I think I can, I can stop there and, uh, and we can get on. To Actually, Devin, it, Devin, if you could, uh, we, we don't have the chance to show slides, but could you say who, who some of your members are? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we represent, uh, refiners, uh, from coast to coast across the country. Um, our, uh, our membership consists of, uh, Suncor, Imperial Oil, Shell, uh, Irving, Federated Co-op with, you know, there's a not, I won't list them all, but okay, yeah. uh, there's a number, number of them. And we I just wanted people to know that, that you cover a range of companies from sort of startup companies with new tech, like, like Lonza Tech. I don't think Lonza Tech is a member, but like Enercam and, and stuff like that, all the way up to big oil companies. And so that's the range of the, the, the producer refiner sector is in the Canadian Fuels Association. And so you, you would say that they, your membership sees the future and supports a carbon intensity based approach to uh, valuing their product. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, in November 2021, we, uh, we released a document called Driving to 2050, which is, is sort of like a roadmap um, that lays out uh, not defined pathways, but examples of pathways and, and where our members are, uh, are heading. Uh, in order to support the, the government of Canada's, uh, you know, ambitions for net zero uh, in 2050. And actually today, um, the government of Canada will be releasing its uh, new emissions reduction plan, which is going to outline uh, their kind of vision and, and targets to, to 2030, in this case, for a stronger ambition in terms of uh, reduction of emissions by 2030. 
So we're, we're eagerly awaiting that and we think the, the clean fuel standard will be a big part of that and, and low carbon fuels uh, hopefully as well. Great, thanks. So we started off with, were you raising your hand? No. Yeah, okay. I'll repeat the question, go ahead. Yes. Okay, so so getting right to the issue of price, right? Okay, so and, and you know being practical. So so these are the issues that we will we'll talk about in a little bit. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna let you hold on to that. We're gonna get to this top. This is the topic of carbon intensity, carbon accounting, which then connects to financial accounting. So how or what is the interplay between policy, financial incentives? and which molecule that we use, but fundamental to that is creating a, a apples to apples comparison of the different molecules. Okay, so that is gonna be a big part of what we talk about in a little bit. Did you have, so sorry, so the question was, I, well, I, I summarized your question. Hmm. Hmm. Right. And your name is? Chris? Chris Michelin from Adnoc asked the question of, well, how is, what is this going to, how is this going to work? Like, what are the technologies that has to happen? Are we talking about changing the nature of the refinery infrastructure? What are, how are we going to fit these different crudes actually into the refineries? John, are you comfortable taking that question? Oh, the answer is brutal. Um, in Europe, you look at the carbon budget that is being given for transport. That is the reference point for what is being given to vehicle CO2 regulation. And what's on the table at the moment is a ban on the internal combustion engine in cars and light vans from 2035. It's not in law yet but it's got a good chance of getting there. Trucks will be a little bit after that, but that means actually by 20, 2050, you model the demand. The demand is right down in petroleum terms, right? And so I can't predict, and I'm leading a business association of competitors, right? And so it's not my job, but Shell, BP, ExxonMobil, Total, any Repsol, you name it, they're, they're, they're a member, right? Um, every single refiner in Europe. And they've all been through this. They all realize that it is absolutely the intent of the regulator to make sure that the demand in road transport is way down from where it is today. And so that means a very substantial reduction in European refining capacity between now, between now and 2050, with we would expect significant changes downwards, even by 2030. Um, there are some biorefinery conversions. Typically, you end up with a far smaller throughput because you've got higher upgrading. You go three times through a hydrogen unit or, 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 or whatever. Um, along the way, we're actually starting to see 
a shift back towards gasoline between the gasoline and diesel balance. And that's partly because of early diesel bans in cities in many, in, in many European countries, certainly in the north, um, uh, Northwest. So the mix of the products is, is, is changing. But the trajectory can only be that, that, that way. Um, the model does think, rely on a complete fleet turnover to eventually to electric cars. Right now, the policies are going in place to deliver that. So for Europe, it's brutal. And we realize that that's different from the rest of the world. It opens up other opportunities to do different technologies. But in, in traditional petroleum refining, it's inexorably downwards. Yeah, if I can add to it, it's a great question and very valid point. For example, I'm just sharing one example, the way we are working with the refining industry. So in refining process, there are an industrial off gases, which are rich in emissions, right? And refiners want to reduce their carbon footprints. So in one of our projects with Indian Oil, which is a leading oil company in India, and uh, we are working with them. So we are taking industry, uh, this refinery of gases, and our process is converting those refinery of gases into product ethanol. Now, that ethanol is being blended at their refinery terminal within their premises. So it is helping them to limit their carbon footprints and also energy security. Also, the other thing which you mentioned, how it is within the refining industry. India has a very ambitious ethanol roadmap. And the genesis of the, that roadmap has been emerged from the point that we, we need to you know, limit our imports of the crude. We need to be more self-sufficient so that refiners can produce that kind of ethanol from, and then they can use that for blending. So, yeah, I would stop there. So then, uh, Devin, if you will, and, and you're, you have your, your, some points about your issue around the carbon intensity and, and the impact of how we're gonna do that scoring. That is the next topic. So, so we'll, we'll get to that. Or anyway, so Devin, if you could. Sure, yeah, and I, I think uh, I share a lot of the same views that uh, that were just uh, that were just mentioned. Um, you know, we don't have a we don't have a, a prediction of, of exactly what things are going to look like. Um, I think it's safe to say it's going to be a mixed bag, um, and that depends also on the kind of the speed um, and how policies are finalized um, over time uh, as to how these different pathways uh, or solutions are going to come into play. Um, I would say, uh, you know, in terms of um, we are trying to leverage our uh, assets in terms of infrastructure as best as possible. Um, these are, you know, these are have a have a great deal of um, of investment in them, and we we want to see them used. So whether that is through co-processing of biofeedstocks or converting to a renewable diesel uh, facility or or adding one on site uh, next to a refinery, so you can leverage um, pieces of infrastructure infrastructure, whether that's hydrogen or electricity. Um, and then I would also make the point that, um, you know, and, and I think this goes, uh, goes to every jurisdiction, but especially in Canada, where we, we cover a, a wide uh, area, um, you know, we have different um, strengths in terms of, uh, you know, feedstocks, as well as if there's uh, basins for storing uh, CO2. Um, so our, our members are looking to what works best for them in that particular region. Um, so whether it's using uh, canola or soy feedstocks in, in the western uh, regions um, or out east where you don't have that same kind of feedstock benefit or um, CO2 uh, storage capacity. Um, so you know, members are, are kind of weighing these options as well as, uh, as they move forward with looking at their different um, uh, potential plans. So one other factor to consider. Great. And so that, that actually brings us to the sort of the heart of the matter. <laughs> that actually brings us to the heart of the matter. And, and th this was absolutely fascinating. So um, to me was, was yesterday, how many people in different sessions independently brought up the need for better carbon budgeting, carbon management, and carbon intensity, right? And so I really wish that uh, Regina from KPMG was in the room. I, I, sh I should have gone out and tackled her and brought her in here. But uh, it's very clear that, and then you brought up your own ideas. And so 
something that I learned at this conference was I did not appreciate that different fossil products have different life cycle assessments. And if you've tracked the alternative fuel space for a long time, every biofuel producer in the world has made this argument. We want to compete on a level playing field. And so it's fascinating. And I'm sure that there are plenty of biofuel producers that would like to slug it out with different fossil producers, right? But one of the strengths of existing California regulation is the fact that California rewards all reductions in carbon intensity. So for example, if somebody improves the efficiency of their refinery, they get credit, they get money for that improvement, right? And I don't know the technical details of the hydrocracker or which, uh, which of the different chemical processes, my degree is in molecular biology, so I need to revisit my chemistry. I know it's criminal, but um, what I do know is that CARB, the California Air Resources Board has a thousand people working there and they are working hard to ensure that every technology improvement is properly recorded for the California market. I'm not saying that the California approach is the best and the only approach, I, but I, I give the California regulatory approach a lot of credit for learning on the fly and for improving what they've been doing. And so what I wanna say is that a world in which every fuel molecule is tracked and, and there it's, its carbon budget is monitored perhaps through blockchain or some other activity to where we actually understand in real time what our emissions are, that might be our future. And so something that needs to happen is that, and this is why I'm glad that we have this audience here. If anything, what we're missing maybe an old school, uh, I'll, I'll maybe I'll play that role, an old school original biofuel producer. But everybody in this community recognizes whether it's the refiners, whether it's the industrial biotech, whether it's the ag side, uh, Devin was just mentioning canola, the need for this kind of accounting. And so, I see a new interface between the oil sector and the alternative fuel sector that was not necessarily there until very recently. Okay, so, so that said, <laughs> I'm gonna now move on to the, the, the third part, which is this part about carbon intensity. So yeah, John, uh, you weren't here yesterday, but as I just said, a lot of people independently started talking about carbon intensity of hydrogen, carbon intensity of of natural gas, carbon intensity of renewable natural gas, carbon intensity of different crudes from different places and how they're refined. Is your membership working through the maths on this? You know, I know that one of your reports mentioned that the amount of investment that needed to happen over the next 20 years to ensure a improving and viable refinery infrastructure could you tell us where your membership is on this idea of carbon accounting? And are there people that we don't know about, or in particular, I don't know about, that are maybe already leading the way on this? How long have we got? Well, right. we've got, we've got <laughs> okay. Um, so our membership and actually our science organization, Kunkawi, that is, is, is adjoined to Fuels Europe, has done a huge amount of work in this area. And it's just important to note that life cycle accounting is actually very tricky. Um, a, a real expert I worked with for some years once said to me, the key skill with life cycle accounting is to choose the answer that you want and then work out how to get to that answer, which was of course a very cynical thing to say, but it does underline that actually that there's a lot of choices you have to make in the history of making something that you have to allocate or not allocate. You, you think if a, if a forest is deforested and then you grow crops, do you allocate the deforestation to those crops for the next 100 years or do you, do you not? Do you allocate that de deforestation to the timber market that it went to? Choices where there's no right answer, right? Um, 
life cycle analysis and carbon accounting is absolutely a key part of European politics. Important to note that there are three areas if you're talking about refining. Scope one, which is the emissions associated with producing the crude oil. Scope two, the emissions from the refinery. Scope three, the emissions from using the products. In Europe, two and three are regulated and they're trying to do one as well. And the funny thing is, is that it's not a consistent carbon price. Policymakers tend to use carbon prices to firstly punish things they don't like and, and B, reward things that they do like. And they tend to give even bigger carbon prices for things that they do like. Um, we've got in Europe at the moment around 80 to 90 euros for stationary source emissions from power stations and refineries. But in terms of things that policymakers do like, like electric vehicles, effective carbon prices, at least 500 euros a ton. Um, and actually, no, it isn't fair, and it's extremely patchy. So you can't just turn up and say, oh, I've made this change in my production of my oil. I expect to get a high carbon price reward for that. You've got to look carefully. What policy does it fit into? And right now in Europe, it wouldn't fit into any of them. So changing the carbon intensity of your crude oil production in another country outside of Europe would give you no difference at all in the value of your crude oil. However, if you did it in Europe, you're actually paying for your carbon emissions if you're doing it in a European field in European waters. So you would save on your carbon costs in European waters. But you're only going to get there if you've got carbon pricing in your own country of production. You see. It's really complicated. And I'm really sorry I can't draw you pictures to do that. But. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I would say. Before I talk about that, I would say carbon accounting, which you brought in, is, is very important. Because when I take a step back and I look at the basic premise of carbon accounting is you need a transparency in that system so that you can see the efforts you are looking to reduce the emissions. They can be visibly seen. And at Lanza Tech, we are in net negative emission technology because we are taking waste emissions which would have gone into the atmosphere, or we are taking waste carbon in agri residue or MSW and converting that into ethanol. So our LC on the, in the LCA terms, our footprints are significantly lower, I would say. Uh, I, some examples I can quote in the case of biomass, using a biomass 60 to 70% lower. So it means we are helping these companies to limit their carbon footprints. And if I see Lanzatec as a solution for the industrial sector, which is uh, right now having a challenge to reduce almost 12 gigaton of emissions out there. So be it steel sector, be it refining sector, with our technology, we are helping them to reduce their carbon footprints, where we see that role of accounting will be very important. That will help them to clearly show that adopting these technologies is helping them to limit their carbon footprints. So that is my view. Uh, Devin, uh, where where is your membership in terms of thinking about accounting? And and obviously, Canada has just must have gone through some process to come up with some policy around this, right? Yeah, well, I I, I think uh, similar to John's point, um, it, it is very complicated, um, and we see that uh, very clearly. Just again across across Canada, um, you know, a number of the provinces have had their own um, systems, whether it's a straight kind of renewable fuel blend mandate. Um, and of course, uh, British Columbia had its own, has its own low carbon fuel standard, and they all use different uh, versions of LCA models and different um, you know, considerations for setting their carbon intensity values. Uh, so it is very much um, kind of a patchwork approach. Um, and now we've got this entirely new uh, fuel LCA model that has been developed uh, for use at the uh, at the national level uh, under the clean fuel standard, um, so that's you know it's going to have uh, variations on the carbon intensities, and what you're going to possibly see is one fuel is valued a lot more in one jurisdiction than another, uh, and that gets back to data choices, uh, modeling assumptions, um, and just even sometimes the, the platform for which they're uh, they're built around. Um, so that's going to be. I think a big learning experience over the next uh, several years as um, you know, our members uh, get used to working with the new model and working through uh, the, the new regulation itself. 
Um, so I think those kind of those kind of changes and, and differences really uh, also impact investment decisions. Um, and so, you know, we really need kind of a consistent, predictable approach so that you can plan out your investments uh, over the next five, 10 years, and that you're not caught all of a sudden with uh, a fuel that's not valued at what you thought you were going to be receiving in terms of a, a credit and a, and a dollar per ton. Um, and so, you know, the example of using, um, uh, you know, avoiding methane emissions and getting kind of a, a, a negative uh, CI score, there's, you know, there's, we're kind of seeing some um, considerations around that even because some jurisdictions uh, are choosing to put in policies that, well, you cannot, you know, your landfills now have to contain or include a kind of methane capture. Um, and so how does that impact your CI score? You might not get that same benefit of avoided emissions and all of a sudden the CI score is, is not the same benefit. So it's these kind of policies that can just kind of come up um, as, uh, you know, over, over the course of time and how that impacts um, your compliance pathways uh, really makes a difference in, in material in terms of investment decisions. It's one point to build on that, I would say, uh, I have seen that carbon accounting still sees at the LCAs and all those things in a very traditional approach. They need to start looking into LCA for the technologies like Lanzatech. For example, we also use our ethanol to make carbon smart products. So ethanol is a carbon and energy carrier. And for every one ton of uh, carbon smart products we produce, almost two ton of CO2 is being uh, removed out of atmosphere. And carbon accounting and the LCA methodology as of now are not very clearly you know, measuring those kind of you know, benefits which our technology is providing. So they need to be more open, I would say, going forward to support these technologies. Um, did we answer your questions to the best? You're comfortable? Are you you're comfortable with the question? Okay, okay. So, so basically, I think what you're touching on is there are big questions. There are really big questions. And I think we recognize those big questions. There needs to be movement and leadership at all levels, right? So we have people in the provincial at the subnational level doing work. We have people at the member state level doing work, but there needs to be this push internationally on this topic so that, you know, a, comp a country like UAE can make that argument so then that could influence how China thinks about it, right? Because let's, let's be, you know, we've been talking about Europe, we've been talking about North America, we've been talking about India. We need to see real movement from a lot of the big emitters. We need them to think deeply about this and to get them on board. So, it's, so, so we talk about, when people are talking about Paris and the need for action after Paris, I'm beginning to think that we need to figure this out, but there's a reason why action hasn't happened is we haven't figured this out yet. You know, there's a reason that we don't have like a general price on carbon because of this complexity and this heterogeneity. So uh, we'll end at half past. So we have about nine minutes. And I just thought that I would let, I would ask a bit of a bonus question, right? So obviously there is a, uh, the, the terrible, invasion of Ukraine has upset uh, fossil fuel markets. And I think it's an open question as to whether people will, whether this activity and this new focus on energy security will accelerate the uptake of renewables or slow the uptake of renewables. And so I'll just let people answer that and then we can go off and uh, have dinner, cocktails, etc. So a same order. So John, do you think that the um, upheaval in the Eurasian fossil fuel market will accelerate the up uptake of renewables. Well, th uh, first, I guess I'd start by saying this genuinely is, I think, a shock to the politics of the energy world. And certainly, I think I can say what's happening in Europe. There is a clear political consensus developing for Europe to become more energy independent, certainly more energy independent. Uh, independent from Russia, uh, has specifically been said. Um, first thing I'll say is clearly there's more that can be done to produce more renewable fuels, but we have to, in the very short term, be 
observing the fact that there's also a grains crisis developing in the world uh, with the loss of potentially the loss of this year's production of Ukraine and Russian grains. And so that cannot impact available food in the world. One of the things that we have learned, again, of course, is the, the resilience of a liquids fuel system, how quickly it can adapt to move liquid fuels to where it's needed. Um, and the fact that we have many more options in Europe to supply crude oil than we have gas. It's simply a more flexible system. And so we have learned again, I think, just how, how resilient a liquid system is. Longer term, I do believe it will help the case for renewables. It will also give some additional spur for further electrification in Europe. I think that's inevitable. Um, the politics of energy are, are very much going in that direction now. Yeah, thanks. I think uh, geopolitics of energy has always been in discussion since centuries, but I would say on the recent situation, why we, what you highlighted, Gary, uh, when it comes to India, because I belong there, we see that our 90%, we are 90% reliant on the imports. And the situation, I would say there may be, you know, temporary reliefs or discounts, but the situation is a wake up call also that we start to looking into diversity of the energy basket where uh, waste carbon can also be a mainstreamed channel. It can be channelized in a better way. Our policies are very open as far as advanced biofuel or recycled carbon is there, but they can be more conducive so that it can be a significant contributor to our energy security and climate commitments by reducing carbon footprints. So I would make that statement. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, um... You know, it comes back to, like we said, a resilient and reliable supply system. Um, I think, you know, prior to this uh, this global event, um, even within within Canada earlier this winter, we had uh, a huge issue with big floods uh, on on our west coast and wiped away a lot of infrastructure. Um, and so we saw that uh, there is there is that resiliency and the, and the ability of a, the traditional uh, liquid fuel sector to step up and, and, and supply. Um, but we also saw that uh, whereas our, our refiners make um, a blend stock, um, you know, they are dependent on getting that uh, ethanol supply. Um, and so, you know, how we move forward and, and how we um, kind of build out our, our future supply systems, um, we have to take into account many of these, I think, uh, different factors in terms of being able to have both, uh, you know, continue with the liquid, uh, traditional liquid fossil side, as well as build out that uh, low carbon supply. Um, as we said, getting back to uh, energy security um, and uh, being able to uh, hopefully, you know, become a kind of a global leader in, the, in this space and, and look to export um, where, where applicable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Devin. I'm gonna give, um... Everybody, one last comment, and then we'll be done. Thanks. Um, so I've managed to just take a few minutes today to share with you what does a, a refinery strategy actually look like to get to net zero by 2050? Often, and it's not the first time I've had reactions from people where they say to me, you must be mad or you must be crazy. We actually have done the worked example of what it looks like. I didn't give the number before, it looks like 650 billion in investment for Europe alone. Um, and uh, that's, that's the capital. And then you do end up with a fuel that is significantly more expensive as well. But it is the worked example of actually what it takes. Europe's deadly serious to do that. It can only work actually if the businesses and the policymakers work together. Because at the end of the day, every one of those projects is a billion euros and it's in steel and concrete in the ground. And it's a, it's a project that needs a long period for capital repayment. And so the businesses actually have to work with the governments to help design the policies. That's, that's my day job when I'm, when I'm not here sharing it with, uh, with you. And, and if, you know, I would say to any country that's considering how to do this, it has to be essentially a partnership between businesses and governments to decide to go down that pathway to put those additional costs onto the economy with the expected payback that you get to the benefits of being net zero in the long term. Thank you. I was hearing in this conference yesterday that as on today, 90% of humanity on this planet is being now covered by net zero commitments and targets. 
if that's the case, it means uh, the way we say at Lanza Tech, we really need to start looking at, at carbon in a very radical way. How you produce that carbon, how you use that carbon, and how you dispose that carbon. And uh, with technologies like Lanza Tech, at the intersection of synthetic biology and uh, engineering, I think we are we are ready and committed to make that happen and help industries out there to meet these net zero targets. So I would stop there. Devin, please. Closing remark. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you know, I think uh, yeah, policies need to work hand in hand with. Um, complementary uh, measures as well in terms of fiscal programs or incentives to support this uh, this transition as we as we go forward. Um, I, I don't think anyone uh, thinks this is going to be inexpensive. Um, quite the opposite. So there has to be that uh, that partnership at that level. Um, uh, here we're seeing, I think, in terms of our membership, we're working more closely than ever with um, our. You know, collaborative associations like Advanced Biofuels Canada, Renewable Industries, and and both, and then also the feedstock providers. So the ag community, the the forestry community, uh, in trying to make sure we, you know, we have sustainable feedstocks that can um, then make use of our technologies and our our skill set and innovation, um, so that we can get the end product to consumers, um, so that uh, that we continue with this reliable system and that. You know, we we try to see as as few disruptions as possible uh, through this uh, transition period. And thank you all for your questions. So have a great day. Hope you had a great conference. <laughs>